Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, today we have Dr. Emily Kit White. She is assistant professor at Osgood Hall uh, Law School and she's presenting a paper on thinking about shame and necessity by Bernard Williams uh, in legal reasoning. So we'll follow the same um, plan as usual, 30 to 40 minutes talk and then discussion and then after that we'll be going to Senate dates. Um, so feel free to join us there too. Perfect. So hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for that. It's so lovely to be back here at the Oxford Jurisprudence uh, Discussion Group. Hassan had kindly said last time I saw him that uh, it was neat to be coming twice, but then a colleague jumped in and said he had been here four times. So now I have, I have a new aim. I hope, uh, I hope I will pass the bar sufficiently that you'll have me back some time. So thank you. Thank you all for being here. I know what a busy term this is, what a busy few weeks this is, and how hard it is to carve out time. So I actually, when I say thank you, I mean it deeply, uh, real gratitude. And my special thanks to Trenton and Philippa and Javier as well for the warm invitation and the really generous hosting. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So I think I need to say a few things to help set up this paper. Um, I'm a legal and political philosopher, and my work broadly draws on the philosophy of emotion to analyze the forms and normative and political aspects of legal reasoning. As Ronald D'Souza once wrote, emotions are a philosophical hub, and they'll lead us into problems of epistemology, ontology, logical form, philosophical psychology, and ethics. And I use them to get into the seams of various questions. I think I should begin by saying something about how I understand emotions. Most philosophical conceptions of emotions consider that they have both physiological and cognitive aspects, and they also have characteristic desires for action. So for example, shame tends to feel hot, and we want to shrink or disappear when we experience that emotion. While well, some psychologists and biologists have suggested a certain universal feature for at least a few core emotions, many if not all emotions contain a value of judgments, and as such they strike us as subjectively involved and image-laden engagements with the world, to quote Robert Solomon's memorable phrase. Where evaluative judgments are embedded within the structure of an emotion, we can expect it to be scripted at least to an extent by time and place and shaped by political and material realities and prone to drawing on idiom, norms, caches of images, binaries, myths, and with all of this extending even into our physiological experience of the emotion. Some cultures say we have butterflies in the stomach, but it sometimes feels different um, across social groups. As Philip Larkin wrote, what scaffolded mind could rebuild experience? And so with the poet's glorious and brutal expediency, he says enough here in a line, I think, to emphasize the socially constructed nature of some elements of some emotions. Bernard Williams summarized the analytical philosophical style as one that involves arguments, distinctions, and plain speech. Today's paper is of this style. As I wrote in the introductory note to this paper, uh, I'm currently actually writing two papers that draw implications from Williams's book on shame and necessity for the field of legal theory. The first paper which I'm speaking to today is uh, cozied up in the terrain of international legal theory in the post-Cold War era. The second is in liberal constitutional theory. In Shame and Necessity, Williams speaks to the field of legal theory to criticize its sometimes shared reverence for certain constructions of the will and notions of intention that echo some deeply held commitments within modern moral philosophy. For Williams, paying attention to the emotions in Greek tragedy brings into view certain now dominant philosophical assumptions that send to the margins or work to obscure entirely certain ethical or political dilemmas. For Williams, this represents something of a loss in a textured understanding of ethical life and political phenomenon that extends into modern legal theory. Now, if you know the book Shame and Necessity, what it does above all, I think, well, is to convey a sense of narrowing of possibilities of the dimensions of ethical life. There's a loss of concepts, a loss of intricacy, and in a non-pejorative sense, a loss of style. 
Much of the book is written against something like this progressivist narrative about moral theory, that what we're working with now is something like better cleaned up notions of some moral concepts. And our task as legal philosophers is to try and bring the law as it is in line with these somehow purified moral concepts. In a, shame, in a chapter in Shame and Necessity entitled Recognizing Responsibility, Williams writes, the question of whether any part of the legal system is in good shape can be discussed only in terms of what we demand of the legal system and how we conceive of the powers of the state. We have conceptions of legal responsibility different from any such conceptions uh, we have conceptions of legal responsibility different from any such conceptions that the Greek had, but that is because we have a different conception of law, not because a different conception of we have a different conception of responsibility. It is not that we have managed to substitute for the Greeks' ideas a purified notion of something called moral responsibility and then do the best we can to embody that in the state of the law. So essentially, as I just said, Williams rejects the idea that it's our task as legal philosophers to embody purified moral ideas in the law. And what follows from this for Williams is that legal philosophy not begin with, not, must not begin with a moral understanding of responsibility and intention, but with a political theory of freedom and the state. So that's the background of this paper. The present paper will eventually be a chapter in the Cambridge history of international law. And the editors of the post-Cold War volume asked me to think about emotions in the theorizing about the history of international law during this particular historical period. Now, at the outset of the paper, as you may have seen, with all due qualifications in the footnotes, uh, we see at the emergence of this post-Cold War period this uh, new hopefulness. Uh, this new optimism, a new set of cosmopolitan rational ideals that are hoped to be borne out in uh, international legal commitments. As Anne Orford writes, during this period, claims made about the capacity of international organizations to guarantee values such as order, peace, human rights, democratic governance, and self-determination mirrored the claims made more generally about the capacity of a rational, cosmopolitan international law to tame nationalist passions and local grabs for power. This in itself then ushered in, in the uh, landscape of international legal theory, a whole series of critical reflections in international law and critical and historical schools of reflections in international law that aim to situate this historical moment some of which might be broadly categorized, as I did in my paper, as something like an effective turn in international law scholarship, mirroring something like the historical turn in international scho law scholarship. Now, as I detail in the paper, a number of projects use emotion and affect to critically reflect on this period of time. It's illuminating to think of the project of bringing emotions back to the study of international law as a move set to counter this historically specific, technocratic, universalist, and formal post-Cold War sensibility structured to claim dominance in the field, which worked to obscure other ways of thinking about global order. As many have recently written, this critical posture has become trickier now that the space of global politics no longer seems dominated by liberal cosmopolitan ideals. Now, I was very glad for the chance to think about emotions and time and international legal history, but it was such a vast topic I was given that I needed to find grip somehow. And what called to me was this small essay by Bernard Williams that uses the contours of a tragedy by Sophocles, the women of Trachis, to speak broadly to the ways that philosophical conceptions of time set the backdrop for certain emotions appearing apt within a particular political era. And so too, how moralized philosophies of mind and action can come to pervade historical thinking, including historical thinking about the law and international law. So for today, given the incredible expertise in the room in the field of legal philosophy, I'm going to try as best I can to cabin much of the Cold War, post-Cold War scaffolding 
within the paper and focus on two arguments, two of the philosophical arguments that speak, I think, more generally to law and a particular form of liberal hopefulness that I think gets embedded in liberal uh, legal theory. So the plays of Sophocles operate, as Williams elsewhere wrote, under an entirely disparate metaphysical landscape from the ones that undergird much of modern Western thought. At work in these ancient Greek tragedies are distinctive conceptions of necessity and fate that recast the scale within which the activities of man play on. Part of Williams's enduring interest in looking back at ancient Greek tragedy lay in its ability to critique contemporary ethical thinking by highlighting the turgidity and narrowness of many of its core concepts and ways of seeing. By contrast, ancient Greek tragedies offer viridescent resources for ethical thinking, uh, Alla Williams, and landscapes where, for example, questions of ethics are not so strictly located around questions and explorations of intention. This exercise of looking back at ethical concepts through the plays, as with other instances of critical genealogical work, aims to consider how attention paid to past practices dislodges what appears to be the unshakable or unseen priors embedded in the base assumptions at play in some of our present day thinking. As Amiya Srinivasan writes, for some critical genealogists, the point of critical genealogy is not merely to call into question the epistemic standing of our representations, but moreover, to liberate us practically from their grip. Or, as Abishai and Marguerite put it, in the ethics of memory, feeling the pull of the exact same term, our thinking is in the grip of powerful images. I share Wittgenstein's belief that the first philosophical move should be to loosen the grip of the metaphor by being aware that it is a metaphor. So my two arguments for today. The first, studying emotions can reveal a hidden moralized psychology that is underpinning a theory that is buried in the foundations of a theory. For Williams, the rich textured depictions of ethical life in the plays of Sophocles work well to draw out some of the limitations of modern Western ethical thinking with its tendency to prize the will and narrow conceptions of intention while minimizing roles for luck, ideas of esteem, the responsibilities of connection, self-perception, and social position. As the plays show, sometimes life and our limited understanding, whether earnest or not, or twisted or wretched or not, can leave us at a loss. The consequence for Williams is not that notions of ethical responsibility and self-control are entirely illusory, but something closer to the unmistakably Nietzschean idea that narrowly construed aims fervently pursued invariably tend to encompass that which they wished to exclude. Spheres of control are limited by our lacking self-awareness as well as other material things. Williams' interest in the plays of Sophocles reflect his more general repudiation of Kantianism and utilitarianism, two modern Western philosophical theories, which for Williams, disastrously oversimplified ethical life. In a memorial delivered at the American Philosophical Association in honor of Williams and later published an inquiry, Jonathan Lear spoke of Williams's interest in the plays of Sophocles. Williams was looking to the plays as Lear saw it as models that resist the moralized psychology he saw as underpinning, underpinning much of modern moral philosophy. These models set in place the idea of reason as a higher faculty that disciplines other aspects of the psyches, like desires and emotions. This is how Lear understands Williams's interest in Nietzsche as a resource for a philosophy of mind and action that blows right past this naive sort of emotion reason divide, which we've all uh, been well educated in being lawyers and legal theorists around the room. Uh, this is a distinction upon which a lot of early international law and continuing international law depends. 
and that much of the early work in the field of law and emotions, which I've been working in for about a decade now, has aimed to unsettle. Lear writing on Williams, writing on Nietzsche, summarizes that. There are three significant hallmarks and one important lacuna in the Nietzschean critique of ethical life. First, there is a critique of all attempts to ground morality, whether in a metaphysical substance like God or the form of the good or in rationality. And as a result of this critique, there is a second heightened concern with providing a naturalist human psychology. If we can no longer appeal to a supreme source of value, we need a psychological, cultural, historical account of how it came to be that we value those values around here. And third, Nietzsche emphasizes a crucial gap between appearance and reality when it comes to our own justifications of our moral practices. Williams was committed, as Lear sees it, to the construction of a naturalist ethical theory with the aim of understanding human beings, including the exercise of their moral, ethical, and social capacities as part of nature, but knowing full well the difficulty lay in there being no independent conception of nature that would establish a clear set of constraints on what a naturalist account could look like. For Williams, the need for a naturalistic moral psychology is generally agreed upon, except for some ancient combatants of the wars of free will, who, as I write in the paper, might be holding their last best ground in the field of legal theory and international legal theory. All of this, of course, results in a tension, a hot tension, between the various attempts to derive an account of values from a purportedly value-free natural science, whether behavioralism, sociobiology, or neuropsychology, which all foundered these three attempts because they lacked the, conceptual, the conceptual and observational resources needed to provide a sufficiently robust explanation, justification, or critique of cultural value-laden life. And the danger that as we try to formulate a more robust human psychology, we will import the values that we're trying to justify. That is, our attempt at a moral psychology will collapse into a moralized psychology. For Williams, even Plato and Aristotle fell into this very same trap. So we have this idea of reason as a higher faculty, which orders other parts of the psyche, including our desires and emotions. But, Williams argues, the only purchase we can get on the idea that the faculty of reason is higher is in terms of the ethical outcomes such a picture is already designed to support. Okay, he's seeing a reverse engineering here and that's what I'm trying to highlight. Plato wanted to derive a particularly strong result, that it is rational for each and every person to live a particular form of ethical life. And Williams argues, he could only get it by building that outlook into his moralized psychology, into his picture of how the psyche worked in the first place. Plato's stark division means that we have rationality which aims at the good and once shed of our mere lower status emotions and desires, we can be left at last with something like a featureless moral person or a featureless moral self. Williams is drawing our attention to the way in which a theory of mind constructed at the level of premises that orders the status of emotions vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the psyche works to set up a series of conclusions about ethical activity. Above all, this is the kind of dynamic that I'm really interested in in legal theory. These uh, foundational pictures of mind and psychology that are right there in so many of our base assumptions that I think we need to think about. <clears throat> Seeing this clearly, of course, something like the same dynamic, uh, G.E.M. Anscombe began her blistering 1958 essay, Modern Moral Philosophy, 
urging that the work of moral philosophy needs to be set aside until we have something like an adequate philosophy of psychology. For Lear, all of this leads back to an essay by Williams entitled Naturalism and Morality, where he argues that a non-moralized, and I think this is important because I think this is where he ends up, a less moralized psychology uses the categories of meaning, reasons, and values, but leaves it open or even problematical in what way moral reasons and ethical values fit with other motives and desires, and how far they express those other motives and how far they are in conflict with them. As I read Williams, a less moralized psychology is not value-free, not at all. It's just less egregiously reverse engineered. As Thomas Nagel wrote not very long ago in the pages of the LRB in this great essay on moral intuitions and human rights, we just simply can't proceed as the questions of ethical epistemology have been solved. What a problematically moralized psychology lacks then is precisely this continued sense of openness of how these parts might fit together. The temptation to settle into a strict Moralized psychology is so overwhelming that for Williams, nothing short of the beguiling texture of the plays can maintain the spirit of openness and the demanding subtlety, complexity, and alertness that's required of ethical thinking. Okay, so that's the first argument. The second argument is on concealed and background emotions. So the plays of Sophocles are useful for Williams for explicating how certain emotions present as downranked, excluded, or otherwise hard to place depending on the ethical and cultural frames in play. In many ways, that's one of the core takeaways from Shame and Necessity, which is that there was a time where shame was emphasized uh, come modern moral philosophy, and now we tend to emphasize guilt and actually, there was a lot to say about some aspects of shame that were maybe useful for thinking about contemporary political, ethical life. Now, I haven't said much about the plot of the play, so I will at last. In The Women of Trachis, Dianera, Sophocles' sweet, ill-fated protagonist, hopes to regain the attention of her long-gone wandering husband, Heracles. Occupied by hope, Dianera seals the fate on a most anguishing death for Heracles by misunderstanding a set of deathbed instructions from a centaur wild bent on revenge, having been previously mortally wounded by Heracles' bow. Dianera was told in a last breath whisper that providing Heracles with a garment soaked in the dying centaur's fluid would ensure her status as her husband's greatest love. Unsteadied by the presence of a beautiful Yule entering her household, Dianera issues the garment which fulfills its role, not by stoking the flames of old desire, but by poisoning Heracles' skin so wickedly that his fun son is forced to burn him on a pyre to bring an end to his excruciating, ceaseless pain. Dianera, heavy with the misery of a lesson learned too late, takes her own life, and Heracles dies in agony, well tricked and completely without honor. It's a grim, devastating play wholly unconcerned with providing anything like a prim moral nugget of a lesson or a release of any sort. As Williams writes, all of the force of the play is directed to leaving in the starkest relief its extreme, undeserved, uncompensated suffering. Okay? So you're left with the end, this heaviness without release. Williams reaches back to Sophocles for a depiction of suffering unaccompanied by a philosophical justification, which itself is a form of horror, to provide an example of an encounter with suffering that is disconnected from the agenda of rationalistic optimism that I've detailed above. 
the far reach back in time is necessary for Williams for the reason that Nietzsche also gives, which is that the later plays, including those written by Euripides, destroyed tragedy, or rather helped it destroy itself in association with the spirit of Socrates, that spirit of Alexandrian optimism, which trusted in reason to make the most basic questions of living into matters of discursive knowledge. The persistent mode of rationalistic optimism flows from a philosophical system that is intent on the delivery of good news, as Williams puts it, meaning a philosophical system constructed off of premises which offer either a theodicy, and here we can think of Leibniz suggesting that any suffering that exists exists, still represents the best of all possible worlds based on God's choice of the most elegantly complex universe, either a theodicy or a world history level justification. And here we can think of Hegel. And for Hegel, horror was part of history moving forward. So it was necessary, at least in this thin way, even where horror itself lacked any sort of intrinsic value. Or when neither a theodicy or that sort of world history level justification would do, when neither of those sorts of rationales would seem convincing in modern times, a philosophical system constructed off premises which altogether obscure or banish the horror of extreme undeserved and uncompensated suffering by placing the realm of moral value outside of history. Okay, so this is how uh, Williams thinks modern moral philosophy works. When we can no longer have the, uh, uh, theodicies, when we no longer believe in a Hegel-like world history level justification for suffering, what Williams sees the next move is to put the realm outside of history altogether. Williams writes that for Kantians or utilitarians, ethical knowledge is beyond history and psychology with each moral outlook in different ways, prescribing the withdrawal of our ethical system from chance and necessity. But therein lies the pernicious error for Williams. For in addressing what they claim to be our most serious concerns, each system of morality would do better if they did not in fact make them disappear. Yet this is what almost all forms of modern moral philosophy effectively does. For when morality itself is disconnected historically and psychologically from the rest of life, as it often is by moral philosophy, and is left as a supposedly self-contained and self-explanatory realm of value, the necessity and chance and the bad news they bring with them are deliberately excluded. So this form of justification, this ultimate exclusion, is more effective as such than any theodicy for the good news that only the moral really or seriously or ultimately matters is shown and not said, and one is invited to accept it without even the disturbance of mentioning the matter. According to Williams, the situation of the rational agent intending to change the world preoccupies both modern moral outlooks. And the very plain fact that everything that an agent does and cares most about can be ruined by uncontrollable necessity and chance becomes no part of their concerns. This hyper focus on control, the good news of control, with the past, even where necessary to reference, just the place to prove priors with bad examples is trademark of the optimistic post-Cold War liberal institutionalist international law that I sketched out in quite a lot of detail at the beginning of the paper. The character of the rational agent intending to change the world is well known there. And so too the overwrought high pitched pivot from atrocity or great suffering to lesson learning and this retreat into formal legal language. For Williams, the plays are antidote or at very least a necessary supplement and a suitable limitation to the tireless aim of moral philosophy to make the world safe for well-disposed people. 
Now, Martha Nussbaum wrote a response to William's paper on the women of Trachis, and the tone of the paper, beginning with its subtitle, Tragedies, Hope, and Justice, which always makes me laugh, um, just because they're such a juxtaposition, I'll remind you that William's paper was called Fictions, Pessimism, Ethics. So this tone of the paper is reminiscent of the characteristic optimism of a post-Cold War liberal institutionalist worldview. And so the exchange, I think, works well to illustrate some of the ways that ideological frames work to exclude and sideline particular emotions in the study of political history of philosophical ideas. So Nussbaum's rationalistic optimism constructs a reality which occludes the very specific form of horror that Williams is interested in and which he uses the tragedy of the play to explicate. Nussbaum critiques William's pessimism, his emphasis on luck and necessity and material forces, by arguing that Williams wrongly underplays the Greek tragedian's interest in the calamities of human origin and in the capacity of human beings for addressing constructively the bad things in the world. Nussbaum is, of course, precisely right that we frequently fail to read well the politics of emergencies, including the ways in which disasters compound existing politically constructed and legally constructed vulnerabilities. Drawing attention to the disastrous consequences of failed public infrastructure in the wake of earthquakes, Nussbaum is correct to expand, even radically so, the realm of the local, that is in Williams' terms, human scale political control. Nevertheless, the critique strikes at the wrong level of analysis. William says nothing that denies political accountability at the local level, even via a radical extension of the category, which indeed I think his own views on ethical responsibility would support. He is speaking rather to a philosophical tradition in which the response to suffering prompts justification on a world historic scale with a tendency for that work of justification to rely on abstractions and universalisms while shedding contingency and specificity all the while. Williams is suggesting that conceptualizations of history invariably answer philosophical questions about the existence of a historical register over and above local events understood as a specific time-bound set of political happenings in a certain place. So Nussbaum's response to Williams to expand the realm of local control might be right in some ways, but the second level of the picture still remains, the one that speaks more generally to one's philosophy of history. The force of Williams' reflection here is to show how much of modern moral philosophy on which much of theorizing of international law depends, philosophically constructs the second register to establish an indomitable form of rationalistic optimism. The form, shape, and function of this second register sets the horizon for our thinking about international law, whether we are cognizant or not of the ways in which it is built into our understanding of the world. Paying attention to the emotions that are excluded or cabined in either the local or historical register sets to light their functions, their politics, and their ghosts that their concepts cannot seem to bear. An attentiveness to emotion reveals background narrative assumptions about time and progress. Williams is interested in inside of time specific confrontations with suffering that are presented without consolation or erasure, both because they seem consonant to the task of ethical thinking, and so too because they present at least the possibility for the creative construction of life fashioned in light of them, or more directly, in light of the refusable, in light of the refusable to be destroyed by the knowledge of that suffering. Ancient Greek tragedy for Williams sets up a confrontation 
with horror, without the recourse to justification, obfuscation, or erasure that is characteristic of modern ethical theories that place moral reality outside of history, which is the home of suffering. We see in critical appraisals of the study of international law, again and again, the same critique of timelessness. Above all, the exchange between Nussbaum and Williams, as I read it, highlights how progress narratives get buried into philosophical premises and the work of emotions in setting these assumptions to light. Williams is highlighting that recourse to a story about progress on a historical scale is a historically specific philosophical construction that draws heavily on core metaphysical assumptions within certain dominant strands of modern moral philosophy. The women of Trachis for Williams opens up a whole new plane for confronting suffering without a form of retreat, thereby coaxing a whole other emo emotional ethical register into the fore. Emotions having objects, directions, idioms, physiological characteristics, etc., often work to resist or counter this push towards higher levels of abstraction and ethical thought. Now, to cast cold light on this incessant tendency to move up and outwards in scale and abstraction to find justifications for suffering, Williams draws in Nietzsche's memorable model of the willing of the eternal occurrence. Uh, the eternal occurrence, which you might remember from the first time you cracked a Nietzsche book, if you haven't read it recently in high school. And someone told me recently this, which is we often read Nietzsche too early. Uh, and I think that's true. And revisiting all of this has been very fruitful. But the model of the willing of the eternal recurrence, as you might recall, is where one chooses in response to a demon's proposal to repeat ad finitum life in its totality, along with every horror and every hideous triviality. Williams writes, we have to ask, what is it that we need the affirmation of the eternal recurrence to overcome? What bad feeling is it? What discontent, what, what discontent as we put it earlier, is the horribleness of the world supposed to inspire? The alternatives of the willing of the eternal recurrence are lying or forgetting. So the affirmation stands as a refusal to eradicate from conscious experience a certain form of horror, the horror of undeserved, unjustified suffering. The power of the affirmation it is that it is a recurring question dropped on your plate. It's a reminder, it's a persistent refusal to let a misdirection run or a justification settle. Drawing from Nietzsche, Williams writes, so if there is a truthfulness about the horrors and no belief about their being worthwhile under some Leibnizian or Hegelian calculation, there will, only, there will be only a fully conscious refusal to be crushed. And we shall need a conception necessarily very schematic of a life that might adequately express that refusal. So we're looking for something like a creative political construction in the absence of consolation. We're looking for a movement that escapes the old pattern of a question. The move mimics much of the role that early Greek plays play for Williams. They offer an example of a way to confront suffering that is distinct from the pull of rationalistic optimism that is so prevalent in modern thought. Distinct from the obfuscation and obstinate control seeking the ills of which are often well known to critical international lawyers. The plays invite a distinctive mode, one which resists the immediate temptation to clamp down, wire down, to punish, to proselytize, and to control. The concern here is not with a political response to suffering. It is the narrowed possibility of response that I'm concerned with the flight, the retreat, or the pivot made possible by formal legal reasoning from the suffering, or the all-out grasp for total control similarly made possible by the laws cast in universalist cosmopolitan form. Neither response seems capable of attending to suffering or the gravity of suffering. This is for Williams, 
This, for Williams, is the force of Nietzsche's question of eternal return, a ceaseless cycle of confrontation to unjustified suffering without retreat. Now, I'm getting wound up, but it's almost time to conclude, so I will. In her incandescent polemical sketch against dryness, Iris Murdoch writes, we have suffered a general loss of concepts, the loss of a moral and political vocabulary. We no longer use a spread out substantial picture of the manifold virtues of man and society. We no longer see man against a background of values of realities which, trans which transcend him. We picture man as a brave naked will surrounded by an easily comprehensible empirical world. We are not isolated free choosers, monarchs of all we survey, but benighted creatures sunk in a reality whose nature we are constantly and overwhelmingly tempted to deform by fantasy. Our current picture of freedom encourages a dreamlike facility where what we require is a renewed sense of the difficulty and complexity of the moral life and opacity of persons." End quote. We've suffered a general loss of concepts in international legal theory as elsewhere. This paper draws heavily on Williams' shame and necessity because the book does well, as I said at the outset, to convey the sense of narrowing with its allusions to cramped quarters, lost registers, and styles. A narrowing that foregrounds an imperious sense of control, which can do more harm than good in political life. One well known and critiqued by critical international legal scholars. In the field of international law, there's a rich literature detailing how the self stylized, technical, and professionalized forms of legal writing is not just removed from impact, that is, stayed dry and gripless in the day to day, but in fact acts as cover for a pernicious and at times brutal and totalizing politics of extraction, exclusion, dispossession, and structured inequality. For Williams, the women of Trachis, through literary example, illustrates how emotions form indelible parts of one's life projects and sense of self, and so too how happiness can be marred by life events. One stands to miss much of the movement, meaning, and texture of the play, were they to view it through the staid modern dichotomy between reason and emotion, a demarcation that has worked to set up the primacy of the will as the most significant feature of ethics or action, and one that has driven so many of the core precepts of our thinking about law and international law. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions.